To begin with, I'm just going to use a couple of basic smart materials. So I'll search for like a metal and I'll turn on the filter for smart materials. And I want to find something that has a little bit of detail, but not too much. This should be good. So we already have a lot more life in this texture, but I've created a couple of different material IDs that we can use. So I'm going to mask it off based off of those. So I think I want the green to probably be the metal and then the red either a plastic or a different kind of metal. And then the blue is going to be sort of a fabric mesh. Uh, so I'll switch to a plastic and find something that feels good. Then what I want to do is add a mask with color selection and then pick the color. I'll switch the color of this metal because I don't really think it stands out very nicely right now, and maybe I'll go with gold. When you're using masks with color selections, it's probably best to decrease the hardness and increase the tolerance of it, or at least that's how I usually like to work. Uh, I don't really have any areas where it's going to do too much on this model, but you can see it's giving a little bit nicer of a transition between some of these areas right here. That's also going to help you prevent having gaps between the materials you have. For my fabric material, I want to make that manually, so I'll just create a folder and call it fabric, and then I'll add a basic fill material, and then I'll add a fill layer with just height information. I'm going to disable pixelator real quick, and then create the height for the fabric. I'll find a weave pattern that looks good for this. You can see though that I'm not able to preview anything because this is just a height channel and we're only previewing unshaded diffuse. You can actually get this information back into the baked lighting stylized filter and you might think that by increasing the diffuse and specular AO and cavity you would get the information back in automatically, but it actually needs to be brought in through these micro detail options right here. And if I just turn them on, it's still not doing anything because it doesn't have any information to reference the micronormals in micro detail. Uh, it doesn't automatically pull that information from the stack below with this filter and you need to provide it manually. So to get around this, you can create an anchor point and put it beneath baked lighting stylized on the same layer. And because it's all set to pass through, it's going to pull information from the channels below. And if I switch back to my baked lighting stylized, I can select the micro normal and get the anchor point that I created, uh, switch it to using the normal, and then do the same thing for the height. So if I start to increase this tiling, you can see it start to appear. And this is really, really useful for getting some of the smaller features in your texture. If I disable the height really quick, you can see that it's starting to get some of the crunchy detail of the metal underneath, which looks really nice. But it's also getting applied here to this fabric where I don't really want it. And the reason why is because if I switch to the normal channel, the normal channel of folders by default is going to be set to combine the normals. What I want to do to fix this is set it to the default blend mode so it overwrites whatever's underneath it. And same with the height. So I'll just set this back up again and then I'll show how you can adjust the micro details to look a little bit better. By default, it doesn't really have good options for representing the height and normal information, and usually what I'd like to do is increase the radius of the AO and then lower the depth of it so it feels a little bit softer. You can also adjust how the height details and the curvature details work individually. I like to increase the edges intensity so you can start to see how the edges are popping through this, and this is going to be where the curvature comes in. If the curvature is looking a little too sharp though, you can switch it from standard to smooth, which is what I usually use. I'm also going to soften this up with a blur filter and I'll set it to a pretty low intensity. And so I can make sure that my weave pattern isn't that aggressive, I'll add a black mask with a fill and decrease it to where it's almost invisible. Doing things this way will let you impact every channel of a layer uh, all at once. Even though I'm just using height here, this is how I tend to work with things. Something else you can do is change the color space of almost any input, and so if I switch this one to linear, it's going to be at its default, but if I switch it to sRGB, you can see that the falloff is a little bit different, and I tend to like that a little bit better in this case. So I'll re-enable my blur, and I think I actually want to increase the AO for this now. And if I preview with pixelator again, you can see that I'm actually starting to get a pattern to this. Uh, you might want to play around with tiling a little bit for certain things. You can see that if I adjust it to different values, it very quickly gets off-grid for this model. Uh, and 64 actually happens to work perfectly for this one. So I'll select this base fabric color layer that I've just renamed, and I'll set it to a color that I like, and I want to increase the roughness of it so it feels a little bit more like fabric. And I'll also add a little bit of metallic because fabric tends to have a kind of sheen to it. 
Uh, and in this case, I think it's probably best represented just through metallic. I'll also add another mask with color selection to this and select the ID. And I think we'll go back and play with the colors a little bit more to make this feel better. And I think this is looking good. A couple of details for this model I've intentionally made a bit too small to be represented well with Pixelator, so you can see how they're getting crunched down in ways that just imply that things are there. And something that I actually forgot to do was I usually like to make a pure black layer underneath everything, and I'll have all of its channels enabled so I can make sure that there's no missing information in each channel. As I cycle through all the layers, you can see that if I switch to opacity here and disable this layer, I was actually missing a lot of this. So if I turn it back on, now it's completely opaque. And I had noticed that back here where I could actually see through the model a little bit. Okay, so since I have the fabric layer configured properly to not take its normals or height from the layers below, I'll go ahead and copy this. And now I'm going to create a screen from that. So this goes over this layer right here, and I'll select the color mask that I made and remove the color that I don't want. And then again, I'll increase the tolerance while decreasing the hardness of it. I'll start by setting the base color of this layer to pretty close to pure black, and I'll increase its metalness while lowering its roughness a whole lot. One thing to understand about making these types of textures is that usually you're not going to get very good reflections out of the baked lighting stylized filter for very glossy metallic objects. And in that case, what I'd like to do is go and find the baked lighting environment filter. I'll drop that in as well so we can preview this a little bit better. I'll disable the baked lighting and I'm going to switch to just this. And you can see that by default it uses a white environment map. So I'll go into my library and switch to filtering for environments, and I'll just drag one of the ones that are the default ones into here. And it's still not doing anything to the screen because I set the screen to black and metallic, but I can actually set the blend mode of baked lighting environment to normal, which is actually a rare case where I'd want to change one of these off of its defaults. And I'll rotate around the environment a little bit until I find something that makes it look good, and maybe I'll switch the environment to something that has a little bit more detail to it. Okay, I think that's good. So I'll rename the layer, and since I only want it to appear on metallic areas, I'll just add a mask for that. And because we copied information from underneath here in this anchor point for baked lighting stylized, I can reuse that and just select it as the anchor point here and grab its metallic channel. And yeah, I don't think that looks very good with the reflections on the fabric, so I'll add a paint layer and paint those out. If I increase the sharpness of the brush, uh, I don't have as much fall off, and I'll also lower its size down some, so it's a little bit more workable, and I'll just fill all this in. So now I have a reflection on all of the metal, and I've re-enabled my baked lighting, and I'll actually switch the uh, reflections to a dodge blend mode, so it's adding on top of this, uh, and maybe I don't want it so aggressive. So what I could do is decrease the exposure, but I want to keep the highlights while lowering the overall darkness some. Uh, what I could do is add a levels and just increase the midpoint of the levels, so it's boosting the contrast a little bit. So maybe I'll do both of these things combined and give it some more hardness to its light fall off, and then I'll switch back down here and bring its exposure down. And there we go. I notice that on the underside of the handle I'm getting some reflection, so I'll increase the specular occlusion so it removes it from there. So I think this is starting to look pretty good, but it's still kind of flat compared to a lot of retro textures, and I think that's mostly from two factors. The first is that most people will add gradients going from the top to the bottom of a model, and it's also lacking a lot of those hand-painted details that make it look less procedural and more like what someone would paint pixel for pixel. You can add gradients really easy in Painter, and I'll start by adding a new fill layer above everything else so far, and I'll search for gradient and find the 3D linear gradient. And you can see it's already adding a top to bottom gradient, but it's not hitting black at the bottom or white at the top. So to fix that, I'm going to increase the contrast. This filter works by using your position map that you've baked, and you can also adjust the 3D start and stop positions so you can have it come from any direction you want. But for this, I'm just going to leave it at its defaults. I'll set the layers blend mode to overlay, and you can start to see how it affects the model, but I think it's a little bit too aggressive for this. And so one thing that I sometimes do is change how it actually blends between these two values. What I'll often do is switch the color space between linear and sRGB and see what feels better, and sRGB is going to create a much more dramatic falloff towards the dark values. 
Also switch it to soft light so it doesn't blow out the colors as much, and I'll lower the opacity some so it's giving a subtler effect. I think lastly I'll add some ambient occlusion, and there's two main ways that I like to add AO. The first is by just using the high poly AO that I baked, and sometimes I'll switch it to sRGB and sometimes I'll set it to linear. Uh, in this case I think I'll use sRGB, and I'll set it to multiply so it's darkening, and you can see how it's really darkening those values nicely. And sometimes I'll also add some blur so it has a softer fall off to it. You can see that if I crank this up to something pretty strong, it's going to lose a lot of its contrast. So I'll add a levels and push this up so it appears a little bit more strongly. Now I have a much softer AO that doesn't emphasize too many of the sharp details, it just adds a bit more pop. I'll rename the layer to something I can remember, and I'll also decrease the levels intensity a bit and make it so it's not quite as blurry. I want to tint the AO so I can bring some more color into the model. So I can do that by adding a fill to this layer, and I'll set it to a color that I like, and I'll just disable all of the channels that I don't need. And I'll set the AO layer to normal so that I can just preview the AO. I'll start switching between some of the blend options on the fill until I find something that feels good. This is more of what I want, so I'll set this layer back to multiply, and you can see how it's adding a bit of blue to it. And I'll cycle between some of the hues so I can find something that feels really nice for this. I think I like the purple, and I think I'll also decrease the opacity some so it's even softer. Right now I also think it's a bit dark, and I don't really like where the highlights are hitting on this model. I could go ahead and start adjusting the levels of this entire texture right before Pixelator happens, which is something that I often do, but I'll make sure to rename this gradient layer, and I'm going to switch back down to Baked Lighting Stylized and see if I can adjust the light angle some. So by default it just adds a sunlight, but you can also add two other lights that are disabled by default. I usually like to increase the intensity of the sun and decrease its saturation and also the saturation of the sky color. So now everything's reading much more neutral, and I'll also adjust the AO so it's more neutral as well. Switching back to my sun and sky, by default the values of the lights, they look like they're zero, but they're not actually set to zero. So you can see if I zero this out, the angle changes. Once I know it's zeroed out properly, I'll play with the angles some until I find something that makes the top and front faces shine a bit better. I think I like how this is looking now, and then I'm going to go into my secondary lights. I'll increase the intensity of the first one, and I'll put it at something pretty high so we can actually see what it's doing. And for these as well, I'll make sure that their values are at their defaults before I start messing with them. And I'm going to adjust this angle until I find something that's hitting the top face nicely. And I think I like how that's looking. The back of the model though is really receiving no attention, and so I'll use the secondary light to add some more detail to that. And by default it looks like it's coming from the back, so again the default values look like they're at zero, but they're not actually zero, so I'll adjust this one too until it feels nice. We're not actually getting any details on the sides from this, but that's okay. One thing that you could do is add another baked lighting stylized filter, and I'll do that by copying it. And I don't actually need this anchor point. And you can see that it's made a broken reference, so I just need to select the one from the layer below, and there we go. I'll disable the lower one for now so we can just preview what the sides look like, and I'll set the sun and sky intensities to zero and just work with the first and second lights. I'll black out all of the lights on this layer to do a quick sanity check and make sure everything's looking correct, and I think it is, so I'll bring them back up. I'll make sure to zero out both of their angle values, and then we can start to rotate both of them until they're hitting the sides of the face. Uh, I think I want them to still come in from the top somewhat, so I'm going to find an angle that finds a nice balance between the two, and then I'll do it for the other side. And there we go. I'll bring up the intensity of them so they pop some more, and then I'll re-enable the lower baked lighting. I'll set this baked lighting to linear dodge because I only want it to add lighting and I don't want it to basically relight what was done by the layer below it. So now you can see that I have the true lighting of the first baked lighting layer and I have the second one adding on top of it. And so I'll rename that to not be confusing and because it's on linear dodge and not pass through it's basically like it just sees black underneath. So for example if I switch this to normal it doesn't really see anything. 
and we're just getting these nice true highlights. At this point, I'm done with most of my procedural work, so I'll save my file so I don't lose my progress, and then I'll move on to showing a couple more tips and tricks, and then finally manual painting. I want to add detail to the screen that I made, and so I'll drop back down to the folder that I created for it and add a new fill layer. I want to pick a bright color that goes nice with what I have already, and so I think that looks good. And I want to have some bars on it, and I could just paint that out manually, but I think I'll begin by doing something a bit more procedural. So on this layers mask, I'll add a fill, and I'll find the tile generator. And what I want to do is set the pattern transformations X count to pretty high, and then I'm going to set the Y count to 1, so it's not tiling on Y and creating squares at all. This is already getting close, but I'm going to adjust the X count and then also the offset a little bit, so it fits the shape that I've created in the model a bit better. And then I'm going to also change this interstice value. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but it basically creates gaps between them. Now I'll add a paint to this layer, and I'm going to set that to multiply. And I'll go through each of these bars and create sort of a random pattern to them. I'll cut off the top portion first, and then I'll go back and refine that. I'm happy with this, but it's getting baked lighting applied to it, and I don't want that, so I'll pull this layer up above most of my other effects, and I'll group it under a folder. I could create a mask for this folder by using the same material ID, but because I already have one from the screen folder, I'll make an anchor point and copy it into this one from there. And so it's pretty close, but it is bleeding off into some of the bottom border here, and so I'll add a paint onto this, and I'll just remove that quickly. All right, that's masked off well now, uh, and I want to add some glow to this so it looks like it's actually emitting light. So I could try to do that just by adding like a blur to this layer's mask itself and ramping that up. But you can see that it's having some problems because this is getting masked off by the folder's mask, and so if I blur just this, this content still exists. And so maybe I could paint this out, and quickly I'll do that just to be sure. But if I also do it this way, I'm just going to be losing definition, and I want to keep those lines intact. Before I do that, I also want to set this layer to linear dodge so that it brightens everything that's underneath it, because I want to keep those nice reflections intact. So I could actually just duplicate this layer and then blur that, but I'm going to go a slightly different route. So I'll show a cool trick that you can do with anchor points. I'm going to make a layer underneath and black this out, and then I'll actually change a little bit about how this works. So I'll rename this to black screen, and then I'm going to remove the mask on the folder temporarily. Now I'll add a fill to this layer, and I'm going to reference the anchor point here and set that to multiply. So now I have everything contained just within this one layer here. Now I can do a really cool trick with anchor points. So what I've done is made a new layer called copy screen and disabled all of its channels, and then I'll create an anchor point on it. This layer is set to pass through, so it copies the data of the contents underneath it as well. But what's cool about this is if I make a layer outside of this folder and then use the anchor point to fill in the base color, you can see that I can actually disable the screen detail folder completely, and this layer is still there. So I can copy contents in and out of folders this way, which is really, really neat. And so now if I want to, I can add a filter to this and add the blur and I'll increase the intensity on it. So yeah, what's really useful about doing it this way is that de this detail is masked within just the screen region, but if I want the highlights to bleed outside of the screen region that was masked while still keeping the detail within the screen, I can do them separately now. So I'll set this folder to linear dodge, and then I need to make sure again that with the paint layer, this isn't going outside of the screen region. And I also realized I'm missing a bar out here, so I'll bring that back in. So yeah, what's really cool about this is that now that this is using an anchor point, I can make this layer use any blend mode that I want. I could even change the color of it independently so that I can have it glow a different color than the lights actually are. Uh, and I could adjust their intensities individually so I can have the bars not be super, super bright, but have it glow a lot brighter. And maybe you can see here that if I increase the blur even more and adjust the levels of it some so it's even brighter, uh, you can see how it's bleeding outside of the area nicely. 
but it's keeping the rest of the information that I have intact. But it's not really making the inside of the bars look like they're glowing all that well, and that's probably because it's like when you're adding blue to blue, you're just going to get more blue, and realistically to the human eye, as things get brighter, they're going to get whiter as well. So to correct for that, I'll add another filter to this layer, and I'll find the HSL filter, which will let me decrease the saturation. So after I bring that down, I'll bring the levels back up as well, and we can start to see that it's really impacting the look a lot more, and I might actually want to do like two layers of blur, one to get the effect where it's increasing the brightness of the bars, and one where it's providing a lot of glow. So I'll group this into a folder called Screen Glow, and I'll create a copy of this, and increase the blur quite a bit. So I've got a soft glow as well, uh, and I want this to be more colored though, so I'm going to remove that HSL for this one. I'll bring it down some and I'll adjust it a little bit more and adjust its fall off to something that I like. So yeah, what's really cool is I can adjust all of these intensities individually and then in the later part of this video when I switch to making this for PBR, I can use that copy screen anchor point and make it go from diffuse detail into the emissive channel. So even though I started in using base color, I can just copy things around really however I like. So that's very, very useful. So now I want to add some curvature to emphasize the edges of this, and I'm going to use the curvature generator, which is one of my favorite things. And I can't drop that in from the library because it's a generator and it needs to be put on a fill layer, like as a channel. And so I'm just going to drag it into the base color channel of this and disable everything else. And so the difference between a generator and a filter is a generator is only going to use the mesh maps, and those are in your texture set settings, whereas a filter is going to modify a layer or the contents of whatever layers are underneath. And so you need to set them up a little bit differently. So by default, curvature is really aggressive, and it's emphasizing the edges too much, and it blows out on the darker details. And there's a couple of different modes that you can switch between to get different effects, but what I like to do is go to unprocessed, so it's giving me a much more flat and basic look. And then I want to go in and adjust the forms of it so I'm not emphasizing the super large forms, and I'm mostly emphasizing the sharper and medium scale forms. I'll set it to overlay, and you can see that it's adjusting the brightness of it as well. And that's because curvature isn't really designed to be used on a color channel. It's supposed to be used on masks or like data channels that are grayscale. So I'll set it to linear instead of auto, and it's not changing the values of it now where it's flat and gray. It's only changing things like the edges and the cavities where it should make it pop. So I think this is getting very close to do more manual paint over, but before I jump into that, I also wanted to mention a problem when you're sometimes working on pixelated textures that are either glossy or very metallic. They'll come out too harsh when you're crunching them down to pixel scales, and so it might actually be better to boost the roughness of things. So if I go to my silver channel, I'm actually going to make it where it's on top of everything just to visualize this a bit better, and I'll add a fill layer just to decrease the roughness of this uniformly, and I'll also set it up to preview a worst case scenario. So if I turn on Pixelator, you can see that it's too noisy to really show up well at all. And what I like to do in this case is just manually boost the roughness of things. I also have a filter called Advanced Normals to Roughness, and despite the name, it also works on height data and normal data. It converts them into roughness data or gloss data that's realistic, and it's based off of a paper and GDC talk that Valve did. The basic principle of it is that roughness detail is really just a microscopic variation in height, which is basically synonymous to normals, and so when you zoom out of an object, it should look rougher as the normals and the height in it start to all kind of blend together to the eye. And so I find this to be the same principle when you're crunching down a texture, like at a retro resolution. Like it looks fine and realistic here, and you can see all the details in it, but if I turn this on, it's really losing a lot. Okay, so now I'm back where I was, and I want to show off one final filter, which is the HBIO filter. And what that's going to do is it's going to look at the height information or the normal information, and it doesn't do both at the same time. Uh, but it's going to look at those and convert them into ambient occlusion and add it into your texture. So it's a little bit like what Baked Lighting Stylize does, but we can force the issue on top of everything else to get a more aggressive look to things. 
So I'll disable my blackout layer so we can preview what it looks like in the ambient occlusion channel. But what I need to do is again use an anchor point to copy it from the AO channel and into the diffuse channel. And then what I can do is set it to a multiply blend mode and bring that back into the base color. To preview what this is doing separately really quick, uh, you can see that if I have the height channel enabled, then it's going to grab the height information that I had from the fabric. And if I switch it to the normal channel and increase this quite a bit, you can see that it's bringing in some of the bumpiness detail that I had on the metals. I can also increase the radius of the height depth and you can really start to see it do some work. But in this case, I'm just gonna use the height channel. And you can also see that there are some scratches that are from the plastic that I used. I'm gonna adjust some of these settings so they feel better for this. And I like to keep the radius up because I want it to affect as large of an area as possible, but I also don't want things to be too sharp, so I might add a bit of blur. And yeah, again, you can see how it's only on the AO channel, which is all well and good if you're working with AO and you're working with PBR, but I need to bring it back into the diffuse channel. So yeah, I'll just use an anchor point and then I can actually add another layer and I'll make a folder for all of this so I can just keep it clean and drag both of them in. I'm going to do some more tweaking on this while I set it up, and I'm going to fast forward through it, but basically I didn't want it to affect the scratches as much. So I did a couple of adjustments to where those weren't impacting the height as much, and then I'm going to move on to adding a logo onto this. So I've brought in a logo that I made for another project, and I have a layer here where I was making some height that was getting converted into AO. And so for its mask, I'll just drop in this logo. And so I'll put the logo in as the grayscale value for this brush. And I'm gonna play with this until it's in a spot that I like it at. And since this is too aggressive, I'll play with some of the settings until I find something that I'm happy with. And I'd like to rename the logos layer to something sensible, and then I'll bring it down and I'll put it in the plastic folder that I have. So now it's starting to impact the baked lighting as well, but it's also pretty sharp. And so I think what I could do is add a bit of blur without really impacting how it's affecting the height if I do it at a lower setting. And yeah, I think that looks good to me. And so these height values are very, very sensitive. So I'm gonna make sure that everything is low enough that it works well. I'm satisfied with that. So I'm gonna also add some color and I want this to act on the base color. So I'll disable all of these other channels and I'll paint maybe a reddish color. And then I think I'll paint something else into the other details. All right, so let's turn Pixelator back on, and it's already looking pretty good, but it's not getting mapped onto these pixels down here very well, and then up here as well. I probably wanna do a little bit of refinement too. I could switch between the two filtering modes to preview how it looks, but I think I do like the look of Near Softer a bit more. So I'm finally gonna do pixel scale manual painting on this, and I'll start with adding a fill layer above everything, and I'll call it manual paint over. And I like to do this in passes, just so if there's anything that I really like, I can keep it. And if there's anything I want to decrease the opacity of after the fact, I have a lot of individual adjustability on things. And I'll also switch over to my tablet for this. So I'll create a couple of soft lines between these things. And you can already see that Pixelator isn't really just for converting procedural painter stuff, like from a full res to a lower resolution you can really go in and manually paint a lot of stuff pixel for pixel. If I wanna go in and manually paint over these buttons and add some details that might imply what they do, I can totally do that. For now though, I'll jump back into this and start to fill out these details. I do like the orange that this color is providing a good bit more, but I wanna make sure that these lines look sort of anti-aliased. So I'm gonna do some very soft painting back and forth to get that where I want. And then I had like these pixel vertex shapes around the corners of this triangle, and so I want to highlight that a little bit better. And then here I'll just do a straight line across. I don't really want it to fade as much, I want it to be a solid line. And I think how it kind of caps off here at the end looks nice. As I'm painting, I'll switch between my painting and erasing, just like 2D or anything else. And so if I find anything too aggressive, I can go and remove it or at least soften it up. So I wanna make this look like it has a little bit of highlighting. So I'll go in and add a bit of that on the top faces of these things. And then maybe a bit up here as well, just so it looks like it has some form to it. And then the same with the text here, I wanna make sure it looks like it has highlighting. 
and I'll just very quickly paint that in. I think I want to decrease the flow of this so I can do some softer painting. And that's much easier to do. People who've worked with Photoshop and other painting programs probably already know this, but I've tended to find that with painting, um, at least for me, when I'm adding light values to things, it comes in much, much stronger than if I'm using dark values. So usually I need to crank up my opacity or flow for dark things, but then I want to lower that down when I'm painting light things. So it's a bit of back and forth as I go between these two different values that I'm painting here. I don't have too much more to add for this part, so I'll just speed right through it and you can see the painting that I'm doing. I'll toggle Pixelator on and off so you can see what it looks like, and it's not really looking too good with Pixelator off. Um, you can paint either way, whether it's on or off, and it tends to do a pretty good job, but I like to keep Pixelator on for 99% of my work and just paint with it on all the time. Uh, the one exception is that when I found your painting faces, it's a lot easier for me at least to work with it off, and then I can preview Pixelator back on and clean up a couple of the pixels here and there. I want to emphasize the edges around this mesh a little bit more, and so I'll switch to a pure black brush and make it pretty soft, and then I'll make some circles around it so it recedes better. And at this point, I want to toggle my paint over on and off so you can see it's making a world of difference now. And so I'll go back and start to continue painting over the fabric and emphasize some of the things that I want there. Something that I didn't really take as much care for when I was making this is I didn't make sure that these pixels aligned in the UVs. And so I probably should have done that. And for a production asset, I would go back and do that really quickly and just rebake things. And because I'm working in Painter, I can bring everything back in and reload all of my baked maps and reload the mesh as well. And everything should project back onto this and look really good. But in this case, I don't think it's hurting too much. So I'll just keep working. <music> So I've switched to my primary monitor. I was recording this video on a larger monitor than this one, but I realized that the UI scaling that it was using has an issue with dragging and dropping the color picker, which is what I'm going to be doing for pretty much the majority of this painting. So I apologize for the UI being a bit smaller now. But from here, I'm going to clean up this area and I'm going to make sure that it looks good on the other side. And again, if I were doing this for like a production asset, I'd probably edit the UVs and rebake things, unless this wasn't a super important thing just to make things align a little bit better. Sometimes on UV seams, it can be hard to target the pixels that are on the edges, but if you do align everything to the pixel grid really well, then you won't tend to have that problem. But worst comes to worst, you can just take this into Photoshop, and so that way you won't be limited to how Painter is projecting from the 3D view. I'll continue doing some cleanup and removing some bright highlights that I don't want, and then also bringing in some of the smaller pixel for pixel details that I want to have present in the final texture. So yeah, again, I like to work with Pixelator on, and it's very easy to control and very predictable, so you don't have to worry about what it looks like with the filter off, except for, again, in really rare cases, like with characters. Sometimes I think it helps to preview it at full resolution. Sometimes I like to go in and lay down a bit of color and then come back and paint over on top of that to smooth things out. And here I want to make these edges feel somewhat beveled. So I'll just drop a few more things in and I want to make sure that it's not too flat in terms of value. Like I've got a lot of detail going on in this plastic and I don't want it to look overly flat or repetitive where I've painted over some things. But on the back of this, I do think it is somewhat too noisy from the scratches, and so I'll flatten some of that out and then go back and paint over it again and make sure that I have the nice balance that I want. So it's not too cloudy and it has a nice breakup, but it doesn't look too gritty. For areas that I want to do that, uh, I'll increase my position jitter and I'll select brighter colors or darker colors from the texture as is, where I want to add some of those values and noise back in and you can see me starting to paint some of that here. 
Looking at the front face now though, I think it has the opposite problem. It's too flat and it needs more noise. So I'll bring in some of those features onto the side. For this model, I want to make sure that I have a nice balance between some subtle noise and then also some cohesive scratches that look like the procedural effects that I had. So I'm going to do some painting back and forth until I find a nice balance between these two. I'm going to paint some fake shadows underneath these buttons as well as add some things that imply that they have functionality to them. And I might not be able to render a complete icon on these, but I can at least imply what they do. And I think for most of these, I'll actually have enough resolution that I can make like a play and pause button. Because of how these buttons pixelated down, I'm not actually going to be able to center this player pause button. And you can see these temporary lines that I've painted here to show where the borders of it are. But I don't think this is too big of a deal for this. If I zoom out, it doesn't really look bad at all. And so you can really get away with implying a lot of things here and not having things be too perfect. So don't spend too much time on those types of things when it's a detail that no one's really ever going to notice. I'll also paint in some beveling and embossing on these. And for this one pixel thin line here, I'll just have to imply that. But for the rest of these, I think I can get away with a bit more. And for the buttons on this side, they're a bit too small to really paint too much in the way of detail, so I'll just apply a basic color coding to those. I'll rename this layer to Paint Layer 1, and then later I'll have like a Paint Layer 2, and so on. And I can have a lot of individual control in that way. And I can also paint different types of features into the different layers and use different blend modes and things like that. This is where I'm going to make a second paint layer now, and I want to remove this bright highlight around this area. So I think I'm going to start by using a multiply blend mode to do that, because I don't want to overwrite the pattern detail that I have. I just want to darken it and help it blend in with the rest of the fabric. And once that's to a value that I like, I'll add another layer above that and start to manually touch up some of the pixels so the pattern looks nice. Here I actually changed the intention of this layer somewhat, and what I decided to do instead was set it to a blend mode where it's going to replace the color, because the baked lighting was removing a lot of the color from this fabric, which I want to almost feel like it's having like a translucent glow to it. So I'm going to paint a flat value all throughout this area, and then you can see when I switch between the color blend mode, it brings that back in really nicely. So I'll do a little bit of touch up here and there to make sure that it feels like everything's seamless. And I'll do that by switching between a brush with a low flow and doing some soft painting. I'm also going to use this layer to brighten the front speaker some, and I'm going to try and paint a couple of natural feeling highlights in it with this as well. And I'll switch between the two different speakers on the sides and zoom out to make sure that everything's reading good at a distance and I don't have any cloudiness. So I'm going to do a lot of back and forth to really nail this in. I'll also add another layer on top where I do what I said I was going to do before and manually paint over this seam here. I want to darken it at the lip between where it meets with the plastic, and I also want to make sure that the pattern blends in seamlessly. I'll also do some manual paint over on the seams between where the fabric meets the base of the plastic because that was kind of a hard UV seam. And I want to make sure that the highlight that was there just looks like it blends in nicely between the two. So I'm going to flatten it out and then I'm going to kind of blend it back in. Here I clean up the bottom lip of the screen and then I also tried to paint in some reflections manually. Ultimately I didn't really like the reflections that I had but I left them in at this point and I also focused on brightening up the bars. At this point, I moved out of the manual paint over folder and I made a new folder where I'm going to do some dodging and burning. And that's going to brighten up areas where I want to emphasize them and I'll also pop some of the highlights in places on edges. And then I'm also going to be able to recede things. And the cool thing about the way that dodging and burning works, uh, I set it to an overlay blend mode and I will tend to stack multiple layers of this to get the effect that I want. And if you're doing a dodge on a bright color, uh, where that's where you're lightening it, it's going to blow out the contrast of it and increase the saturation. And the opposite for when you're burning on a dark value, it's going to really increase the uh, contrast on it. And especially on the fabric, it's going to make those oranges really stand out. So yeah, what I do to accomplish this is I use a pure white 
when I want to dodge and I use a pure black when I want to burn and I tend to use a very low flow on this and sometimes I'll even drop it down to a super low opacity as well. And just as a reminder, I want to make sure that whenever I'm working with a folder, I set the folder's blend mode to pass through because there was a point early in this painting process where I realized I was just darkening and lightening things and painting opaque, even though the layer itself was set to overlay. I won't speed up this process too much so you can really take in what it's doing because this is probably my favorite point in texturing. I think it's where it brings the most character into the texture. And because I'm going around every single face of the model a lot, I don't want you to miss anything that I'm doing. A couple of things that I want to highlight as part of this process is that I tried to think about how someone's hands might be touching this. And so on the handle, I treated the areas where the hands would touch a little bit differently. And then also on the back plate, I made it where it was kind of rubbed. And then I also emphasized some of the planar changes between the different shapes and pulled those out towards the viewer more. I'll pause for a moment here so you can really see the difference between having this dodge and burn off versus on. I'll also take a second to really highlight the difference between working with a low flow versus a low opacity. When you're working with a low flow, eventually you will build up to the solid value that you have selected. Whereas if you're working with a low opacity, you're only going to paint up to that opacity value. I'll make a second dodge burn layer, and what I want to do with this one is add some color into it instead of just painting with white. And what that will allow me to do is bring out some of the oranges and some of the reds, and then also some of the blues a whole lot better. I will also use this layer to paint some white and black, and on this one I'm going to focus less on the large scale forms and more on highlighting the edges of the plastic. Here I wanted to add some more darkening around where the handle meets the base, but I wasn't able to do that in the 3D view, so I switched to my 2D view, and it was important for me to switch my brush alignment from the camera to working on the UVs, and that's not going to allow me to paint across seams anymore, but because this was all unwrapped mostly on one seam, it was pretty easy to do. But the reason I needed to switch was because if I was working with the camera alignment, then it would still be projecting as if it were in 3D, and so it would bleed across into other UVs when I didn't want it to. I don't have much to comment on this part, I'm just laying in some more highlights and darkening around the edges to emphasize things, so I'll just let you watch that. So I'm going to start to make a folder for final touch-ups, and in this at first, I wanted to show how you can use something called the 3D Distance Filter, and it makes it look like something is glowing from a certain point. It can also emulate the look of a point light with no shadows. And so for this model, what I decided to do was I pushed it kind of off and in front of the model. And I did that using the position XYZ controls and also adjusting the offset and contrast values. And then I changed the blend mode on it so it was doing some brightening and darkening. Then I added another top down gradient using the way that I showed before on another layer. And I just wanted to make it to where the bottom face of this boombox was almost completely black. Then I switched to the back plate on this, and I started to add some detail that implied product information on it. Here I decided to just add a random symbol onto one of these buttons to see how it pixelated down, and it actually worked out making kind of a cool pattern. From there I touched up some of the bumper buttons as well. I'll make another layer where I do some very large scale dodging and burning, and I used a brush size that was above 100 for that, so I think I switched between something like 400 and 500. You can also hopefully see how when I'm dodging it and bringing up some of the highlights, it doesn't affect the dark area so much, so that some of the painted shadows that I've added still stay. Here I'll slow down and I'll show me toggling on and off these layers, so you can see how I've been doing these touch ups, and it really makes it look like it's something completely new.
Finally, I'm going to add a layer where I do some hue and saturation and contrast adjustments to this. So I made a new layer and set it to pass through, and I'm only operating on the color channel again. And then I'm going to add some different filters to that layer where I can do some of the final corrections that I want to get the value range and the colors where I want them to be. So if I was working with a color palette or a LUT in Pixelator, I might want to go back into this layer and do some tweaking to make sure that everything punches through nicely when it's remapped onto those new colors. I can also use the color balance filter to add things like split toning, where I could tint the dark values one hue and the light values another hue, and so that's something that's really useful for when you want to bring out the value-based differences between things in a way that just working with value alone can't really accomplish. So I'm going to switch back to tweaking with Pixelator itself now, and I'll enable the LUT that I have in this project. But because I have the opacity channel enabled on this filter, the LUT is also going to get applied to it. So in that case, what I like to do is make duplicates of the Pixelator filter, and I'll apply different effects on them. Unfortunately, there's not a way where inside of the filter I can detect which type of channel it's operating on and do things dependent on that. At least not that I know of, and so if anybody knows anything about that, please do let me know. I'll also do the same treatment for if I were working with a normal map, and when we move on to making this into a PBR version, I'll showcase that a bit more. I really like the look of this promo LUT, but I'm also going to cycle between some of the built-in ones, and probably one of my favorites is the Game Boy Color Palette. It just has like a super muted, almost like a vintage Instagram filter look to it, and I don't know how else to put it, it's like very flat, but it still retains a nice amount of contrast, and it just generally has a cool selection of colors to it. But then after that, I'm going to switch to generating a custom color palette for this, and I'll talk a bit more about how I tend to use that on a finished asset. I first played around with some of the settings, I moved the initial random seed around, and I also adjusted the color importance, but I realized that because this texture is so gray dominant, it was emphasizing those way too much versus finding the odd oranges and blues that were in it. This is something that I'm going to be addressing in a future update. What I can do to try to address this is to boost the saturation of things, crunch some of the levels so oranges and blues are more vibrant and so they're retained better in the final color palette. But in an update, I'm actually going to be adding another feature that detects colors that are underrepresented in the palette and tries to inject them into it so they're much better preserved. So in the future, it wouldn't be emphasizing these grays as much, and it would be finding the oranges and blues a whole lot better and retaining the definition in them. But for this, what I'll have to do is adjust the random seed, and I also do a bit of paint over on the screen portion of this where the blue bars are until it detects the colors that I want, and then I'm going to work with the quality slider and the seed a bit more to hone it in. Ultimately what I decided to do was take the color palette that I had generated with this and turn it into a LUT. So what that allowed me to do was export out that 4K image and then I could bring it into Photoshop and I could get the palette from that. And Photoshop has good tools for taking a palette and creating new colors from it. So as I get into that, I'll show more. As I move around this palette, you can see how represented these grayscale values are versus the oranges and the blues. There's not much definition in those, and then as I move down towards the bottom of the image, you can see the blue range in it, and there's really only like two colors there, whereas there's still a lot of gray. And so what I need to do to fix that is first switch it to indexed color, and if I have the palette mode set to exact, you can see that it has 32 colors, which is exactly what was generated by Pixelator, so I know this is correct, and then I can find the option for actually adjusting the color tables. Once you have this in indexed color, you can go under image, mode, and find color table, and now we can see the colors that are in this image and how many grays I have. So I'll go through each of these and find some of the grays that I think are the most similar to each other, and I'm going to start to replace them with oranges and blues. I'm also going to increase the saturation of the blues where I thought they needed more. And just to emphasize again, just because a color is in a palette doesn't mean that it's going to be represented in the final texture. 
Uh, so if I were to put something like a green in here, because there was no green in my texture, it would not be present in the final texture, even if it were in the LUT. I'm going to save out my color table, and what I need to do now is create a new LUT from it, because I've mapped these colors onto portions of the LUT texture where they shouldn't appear, and so this LUT is no longer representative or correct of anything. So what I do is I go to the lookup table quantization mode and I enable outputting the default LUT. So I'm again going to export that out at 4K. And then when I go back into Photoshop, I can open up that texture. And when I switch it to indexed mode, I'll be able to open the color table that I had saved out and apply it to this. So this texture is showing all 16.7 million possible colors in an 8-bit image. And yeah, it's just a map of how these original colors would get mapped onto new colors. So if I go under image, indexed color, and then select the custom palette mode, and then load my color table that I had saved out, you can see now I have a new generated LUT, and I can bring that back into Painter. So now this is more representative of what I want. It's got the blues a lot better. I'm going to also go off screen and do some adjusting after the fact to really make the oranges shine more. But for now, I'll export this out because it's just about ready to use in any other program. And since this is a 256 resolution texture, I can export it out at that resolution and use no padding and hit export. So now it's ready to go. And I'm gonna move on to doing a PBR version of this asset.